Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for coming out on this cold afternoon. Uh, my name is May Nye. I'm a professor of history and Asian American studies, and I am the co-director of Columbia's Center for the Study of Ethnicity and Race. And it's my great pleasure to host this program uh, along with the journalism school um, so we could learn from the enormous career and achievements of Juan Gonzalez. Um, I want to thank the Journalism School for providing the venue and the AV and all the logistics for today. Um, thank you very much and thank you to our center for a support for this program. Um, I bring you greetings from Dean Jelani Cobb, who unfortunately could not be here this afternoon to greet you in person. So it's my great pleasure to um, kick off this program. For those of you who are students in, in the university, whether it's in the college or general studies or social work or journalism, uh, CSER, our center, welcomes your participation. We have uh, classes um, that we are now uh, kind of um, bulking up classes that are open to graduate students, to MA students. So if you look at our website, you will see the classes that we have. Uh, CSER is really the main center on this campus where discussions of race and ethnicity are at the center of everything we do. So thank you for coming. I'm going to introduce now our moderator, um, who is going to introduce our guest and our other speakers. Ed Morales, who is a long-term journalist uh, in New York City, and we are so privileged that he teaches in our program at CSER. He's been teaching with us for about 10 years, and his classes are enormously popular. So I, if you want to check out CSER classes, check out Ed's classes. But please welcome Ed Morales. Oh, uh, thanks so much, uh, May. Um, I'm so uh, happy to be here today with you. Um, first of all, uh, having been a faculty member at CSER for all these years and uh, feeling very comfortable here at uh, Columbia. And also, we're here to hear a speech by Juan Gonzalez, who is uh, one of the pivotal figures for the New York Puerto Rican community here. Um, uh, and is someone that you know I've looked up to for a long time. Uh, I uh, was inspired first by the uh, young lord's commitment to um, uh, radical uh, social uh, analysis, and um, and then when one uh, moved on to become a journalist, uh, it was about the same time that uh, a few years later um, that uh, I started becoming a, a freelance journalist, and uh, you know, uh, in in some ways I, I tried to uh, emulate what. Uh, Juan was doing, and uh, he's really someone that uh, is so important to our city and um, to my people, because my parents are from Puerto Rico as well. So let me introduce uh, Juan with the uh, obligatory biographical um, list of accomplishments. Uh, Juan Gonzalez is an award-winning journalist and investigative reporter who spent 29 years as a columnist for the Daily News. He's a two-time winner of the George Polk Award and co-host of Democracy Now!, which I watch unfailingly every morning at 8 o'clock. <clears throat> Author of Harvest of Empire, History of Latinos in America, which is a, a book that I've taught many times and now has a new edition out. Um, founder and past president of the NAHJ, National Association of Hispanic Journalists. Um, he has been uh, affiliate faculty uh, for the Center of Latin American Studies and Department of Latino and Caribbean, uh, Caribbean Studies at Rutgers. And uh, as I've said, um, you know, uh, Juan was one of the uh, original members of uh, the Young Lords whose uh, exploits uh, have been detailed 
in uh, books like The Young Lords, A Radical History by Joanna Fernandez, which I reviewed for The Nation and was really one of the best uh, two months I've spent um, doing that. <coughs> and uh, if you have a chance, you should catch the award-winning documentary Takeover, um, which appeared at Tribeca Film Festival in 2021, which is a great way to really get a sense of uh, what the Young Lords did, incredible accomplishments of people who were, you know, in their late teens and early 20s, which, you know, I, I can't imagine um, the courage that it took to do that. So without further ado, uh, here's Juan Gonzalez uh, with uh, one of his uh, final lectures in New York City area. Uh, good evening, everyone. Um, my thanks to the J School's Dean Jelani Cobb and to May Nye, the co-director of the Center for Ethnicity and Race, for sponsoring this event. My deepest gratitude to Professors Nina Alvarez and Claudio Lomnitz and to moderator Ed Morales, a true dream team of journalists and scholars for agreeing to give their time this afternoon to engage in conversation with me. Many of you may have heard by now that in a few weeks I will be leaving the New York area, the city that I've called home for most of my life, where I grew up, where I was shaped professionally and politically, and will instead be relocating to Chicago. Uh, the hometown of my marvelous wife, Lilia Fernandez, who's here, where all her family still resides and where she is now a professor of history at University of Illinois. At my age, I just turned 75 this month, that's called a major change. And the deeper you get into your golden years, the more aches and pains and illnesses gnaw at you, the greater the tendency to look back and ask, what did I do with my life all these years? So it occurred to me that the best way to say goodbye to this city where I've had so many terrific memories, so many friends and colleagues, was with some farewell talks that I would turn up, I would attempt to sum up some of the key lessons I've gleaned through much trial and error through successes and setbacks, perhaps to reveal as well some incidents from the past that I've never had the opportunity to disclose, but which could provide insight to a younger generation who are still determined to practice good journalism and still devoted to making a better world possible. As some of you know, mine has not been your typical journalism career. I've been grappling now for more than 50 years, initially as an activist, then for decades as a journalist and a student of history, with the burning issue of how oppressed and marginalized people can best create and disseminate a narrative that truly reflects their lives, not just accepting the simple-minded, stereotypical, and often denigrating narratives of them fashioned by those with greater power and wealth, but instead offering a fuller and more accurate picture of who they are, of their passion and their pain, their achievements and failures, their hopes and their dreams. Because of my insistence on this approach throughout my career, I was labeled by many of my colleagues in the commercial media as a, quote, advocacy journalist as if that was somehow a distinct and less developed form of real journalism, some outlier. But more about that in a minute. That I ended up a reporter and a radical activist to boot, you can chalk up to Miss Bonagura, to the 1968 Columbia student strike, and to the Young Lords. One gave me the skills, the other two, the two gave me the mind and the heart. Pauline Bonagura was the one public school teacher every kid dreams of. 
She was the English and journalism instructor at Franklin K. Lane High School in East New York, Brooklyn. If you haven't been outside of New York City, you don't know, you've never heard of East New York until the new show that just came out. Young, charismatic, and relentless, she had a hopeless love affair with the English language and was determined all her students would master not only grammar and writing, but the art of reporting. The number of fine journalists she produced is remarkable. David Vidal, who for years was a foreign correspondent for the New York Times. Stephen Handelman, who worked for decades for the Toronto Star. Carol Carmichael, who was an editor for years, a managing editor at the Seattle Times. Janet McMillan, a, a sterling reporter at the Philadelphia Inquirer. All of us were Bonagura students. She plucked me, a shy kid from a working class Puerto Rican family in the Cypress Hills projects of East New York, and decided that I would be editor of the Lane Reporter, the paper that she advised, a paper that almost every year won top prizes from the Columbia Scholastic Press Association. And that probably had a lot to do with my eventually getting into Columbia College on a full scholarship. My activism, of course, began right here on Morningside Heights as a Columbia undergrad. On April 23, 1968, in the midst of the Vietnam War, and only weeks after Martin Luther King was gunned down in Memphis, touching off a stunning series of urban rebellions in America, right here on this campus, hundreds of Columbia and Barnard students occupied and barricaded several buildings. We did so to protest the university's arrogant and racist land expansion into, onto Morningside Heights and the Harlem neighborhoods, and to achieve an end to the university's research for the military in Vietnam. I was a senior at the time, first in my family to attend college. Somehow I emerged as one of the leaders of our student strike coordinating committee, which is how I came to know and befriend many of the young 1960s radicals who would go on to considerable notoriety. SDS leaders Mark Rudd, Bernadine Dorn, Tom Hayden, David Gilbert, Kathy Boudin, Yippie leader Abby Hoffman, the great civil rights lawyers Jerry Lefcourt and William Kunstler. Our initial week-long protest ended with a brutal police assault on the campus where more than 700 of us were arrested, more than 100 people injured and hospitalized, including several professors, all of which provoked a massive student boycott of classes that paralyzed the university for the rest of the semester, that reverberated across the nation at other college campuses, and that soon resulted in the resignation of Columbia President Grayson Kirk and the university provost David Truman. A year later, I helped found the Young Lords organization in East Harlem, the neighborhood where I had originally grown up. The Lords were a, bra a loud, brash, rebellious, and talented group who sought to defend the Puerto Rican migrant community from systemic discrimination and to end our homeland's colonial status. For a few brief years, we became a thorn in the side of the establishment and the police in this town and cities throughout the East Coast, with our many occupations of institutions and militant actions against police abuse. And in the process, we inspired a generation of young Latinos to demand more equitable treatment. We focused not only on the concrete bread and butter issues of more traditional community organizers, better schools, better health care, better city services, but we also in the mold of other organizations like the Black Panther Party and the Republic of New Africa openly espoused socialist ideals and militant internationalism, refusing to fight in the Vietnam War, inspired by the Cuban Revolution, seeking solidarity with liberation wars against Western imperialism in Africa and Latin America. We not only created our own bilingual newspaper, Palante, our own weekly radio show on community radio station WBAI, 
we consciously sought to shape how the commercial media covered our actions and ideas. As a result, the Lords emerged as one of the few 1960s revolutionary groups that received considerable sympathetic coverage in the mainstream press. This was no accident. It had everything to do with understanding storytelling. Our Minister of Information, Pablo Yoruba Guzman, who was only 19 when we started, had studied while as a student at Bronx High School of Science, one of the visionary media scholars of that era, the Canadian philosopher Marshall McLuhan. Pablo had quickly digested the essence of McLuhan's remarkable critique that every mass medium touches the human brain in a different manner, that every medium acts on us not primarily through the words or images it conveys, but through the way it connects to our brain and triggers our emotions. McLuhan, of course, famously proclaimed that, quote, the media are extensions of human beings, that the content of a medium, he once wrote, is like the juicy piece of meat carried by the burglar to distract the watchdog of the mind. Pablo then consciously worked to shape a distinct message for each medium that we dealt with, newspapers, radio, TV. McLuhan, of course, was writing long before the creation of the internet, the World Wide Web, and the smartphone, advances that only further confirmed his pioneering theories. Think about it. What is more important today, the actual content of any message or video we receive on our smartphone, or the fact that the device itself has become the most indispensable instrument of modern society, tying us to the outside world, and through it, not only are we in constant contact with our family, friends, employers, and even total strangers, but unseen forces are constantly tracking us, surveilling our thoughts and wants, our every search, our every action, everywhere we go. Even as youngsters, we in the Lords understood the power of the media, and we consciously cultivated that good coverage. We were helped by the first brilliant crop of young black and Latino reporters in the city's press, to whom Pablo fed exclusives, and who in turn repaid us with more sympathetic coverage than their white colleagues. People like a young Ed Bradley at WCBS, like Gil Noble at WABC, like Gloria Rojas at WNBC, Rudy Garcia at the Daily News, and of course, white writers like Jack Newfield at the Village Voice. Shaping the narrative, however, does not simply involve good stories. To be done well, it requires a deep connection, a virtual fusion between the storytellers and the subjects of their stories. And we have two excellent examples here, the people that are going to have conversations with me. Um, uh, Claudio did it in his epic book, uh, The Return of Comrade Ricardo Flores Magón. And uh, Nina did it as a producer as one of the producers of the epic uh, PBS series, Latino Americans. And I had the uh, pleasure to work with her on, uh, on that uh, series. We the Lords were, if anything, intimately a part of the Puerto Rican community's quest for respect and equal rights in the country. Many of the issues we see reflected today among young people in the Black Lives Matter movement were issues that we raised 50 years ago. The fight against police brutality in black and brown neighborhoods, against structural racial inequities in housing, education, health care, and employment, against gender inequities uh, uh, and uh, patriarchy, uh, to salvage and affirm our history, culture, and language as innately valuable in a multicultural society. Even the hot button question of racism within our communities is not something new. We confronted it openly in the Lords back then. In fact, 
While we were proudly a Puerto Rican organization, more than 25% of our membership were black uh, and, uh, and Afro-Latino, as was the majority of our leadership. So it was no incident, you know, no a accident, that when the Lords fell apart in the mid-1970s, several of us ended up going into journalism. Pablo, for more than 30 years, as a reporter at WCBS-TV. Felipe Luciano, our chairman, as a, an Emmy award-winning reporter at WNBC-TV. Uh, Geraldo Rivera, and that wasn't a member, he was our lawyer, but everyone knows where Geraldo went. And, <laughs> and, uh, and he's had a, a sometimes checkered history. Uh, and uh, Iris Morales, who went on to become the general counsel for children's television uh, workshop for many years and became then an entertainment lawyer and, uh, and now wants her own publishing company. My first job in journalism was at the Philadelphia Daily News in 1978. Uh, I started as a general assignment reporter. Before my rookie year was up, the Iran, the Iran hostage crisis had erupted. And I'll never forget being in the newsroom one day and going to the bulletin board where employees posted all kinds of information on things for sale and, uh, uh, and, uh, and other things of interest. And there was a petition on the bulletin board by many of my, the reporters at the Philadelphia Daily News, an open letter to the White House demanding that if the hostages were harmed, uh, that we should uh, nuke Tehran. These were intelligent reporters uh, in a major metropolitan newspaper openly saying we should drop a nuclear bomb on Iran uh, to solve the crisis that we were facing. So of course I was uh, shocked to say the least. So I went into my editor-in-chief, I was just a young reporter at the time, and Editor Chief had, a, had taken a liking to me, and I, I said, "You have a policy of uh, of, um, of allowing any reporter to submit an opinion piece for the paper. I want to submit an opinion piece to counter <laughs> this thing on the bulletin board. I want to write a column, send the Shah back, because that was what the whole <laughs> Iran crisis was about. That the Shah of Iran." illegally imposed upon the Iranian people as a result of a CIA backed coup in 1953, had been overthrown by the masses of Iranians and had fled to the United States, and the Iranians were demanding that he be returned to be held to trial, uh, uh, to held to justice. And, uh, and that was what the hostage crisis was about. Uh, and uh, so, I wrote the opinion piece, and the editor-in-chief calls me in, and he says, you know, you hit us kind of hard, uh, but I'm going to run your piece. I'm going to run your piece. It's well-written, but uh, uh, I'm, I'm telling you, it's not easy. That was my first understanding that it was possible to challenge the dominant narrative, even in the commercial media, uh, and at times have some kind of success. Uh, about a year later, I had been part of a group that had helped uh, the Puerto Rican community that had built an organization called the National Congress for Puerto Rican Rights. And uh, at its founding convention, they elected me president of the organization. Now, it was a volunteer organization. It was, uh, uh, it, it was, it, it, uh, and it was basically involved in issues around the Puerto Rican community. At the time, I was a, uh, had gone from general assignment to becoming a labor reporter uh, at the Philadelphia Daily News, but the editor-in-chief calls me in again. He says, I can't have that. I can't have my reporters uh, writing news during the day and then in the evening or on their spare t in their spare time, um, uh, in their spare time being involved in activist causes. And I said, well, that's funny because didn't you just have Tom Cooney, our, our top writer, uh, write all the lead stories about the Pope's visit to Philadelphia? Do you know that Tom Cooney is the president of the Holy Name Society of his church? He's a devout Catholic. Uh, he's active in the Catholic Church. And you have no problem with him covering the Pope. Uh, but you're telling me that I cannot be active 
uh, when I'm not even covering the Puerto Rican or the Latino community. So the editor says to me, well, I'm firm on this. You either resign from this organization or we're going to have to let you go. So I was, it was I just started out in my career, figured what, what can I do? So luckily, I had a, a mentor who helped me quite a bit, a magnificent gentleman by the name of Charles Sumner Stone, Chuck Stone, the dean of black journalists in Philadelphia. Chuck Stone had been a Tuskegee Airman. He had been the speechwriter for Adam Clayton Powell when Adam Clayton Powell was a congressman. He had been the editor of the Chicago Defender before he became a senior editor and a columnist at the Philadelphia Daily News. So Chuck Stone wasn't afraid of anything. And Chuck pulled me aside and he said, Juan, uh, don't be intimidated, first of all. Second, document everything. Always keep a record of everything you do on your correspondence with those in power, because you may need that at some point or another. And then he said, check the union contract. I said, the union contract? So I checked the contract of the Newspaper Guild, and then there was a, a, a clause in the Newspaper Guild contract that said that if a member of the Guild had been elected to a public office or an office of public responsibility, for a term up to four years that they could request a leave of absence and then get their job back. So in other words, this thing had been fought over years ago, years before we even became reporters, and there had already been a solution fashioned to deal with the question of uh, social activism and social participation of journalists and reporters. So I went into my editor and I said, I'm invoking this clause of the union contract. Uh, I'm uh, requesting a leave of absence to fulfill my term as president, then I expect to be able to get my job back. Uh, uh, and uh, so I was able to get my job back. But it was another lesson that the battle over activism and uh, 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 within journalism has, uh, is a long running battle. Thankfully, my experiences in the Lords and my own readings uh, had strengthened my growing belief that the commercial media were not the entire universe of the press in America. I've managed to work not only in mainstream or commercial journalism, but proudly and almost simultaneously in the alternative and the dissident press. Uh, for the past 26 years, as co-host with Amy Goodman of a marvelous show, Democracy Now!, uh, and at various times as well in the Spanish language uh, press. When I started Democracy Now! in 1996, there were just three of us, Amy, myself, and a producer. And the show was just on a handful of Pacifica stations. And my colleagues in the commercial media would say, what are you doing with that crazy left-wing show? Uh, but both its audience and its influence has steadily grown over the years to the point that we are now one of the major sources of dissident news coverage in America. Uh, and uh, DN uh, now is on 1,300 stations, through, not only in the US, but throughout Latin America. Uh, uh, several hundred in Latin America, more than a million followers on social media, and a full-time staff of 30 people, state-of-the-art studios in, in the Chelsea section of uh, Manhattan and one of the few organizations that consistently covers international news. All of that started from just a few people who were convinced that there was another way to tell the news narratives uh, in this country. In my 2012 book, News for All the People, The Epic Story of Race and the American Media, my co-author Joe Torres and I examined in depth the historic conflicts and interplay between these three distinct and separate streams of the media, the commercial press, the alternate, alternative or dissident press, and the press by people of color, each of which have a long history in this country. And there's been a constant narrative and, and counter-narrative between them. The commercial press from public occurrences in 1690, Benjamin Harris and the Boston Newsletter uh, uh, in 1704 through to the Pulitzer and, and Hearst chains, and of course to the modern Goliaths of our time, the CNNs, the New York Times, the Fox News, and so forth. 
But there's been a separate stream of the press in America. The radical press, from the working men's uh, uh, publications of the 1830s through the, the muckrakers of the late 19th century, on um, Ray Standard Bacon, Baker, uh, Lincoln Steffens, Upton Sinclair, Ida Tarbell, the socialist and communist presses of the, of the early and mid 20th century, the new left press of the 1960s and to the progressive blogs and news sites of today, such as Common Dreams, Sheer Post, Counterpunch, The Intercept, Consortium News. This whole other stream of the press has been involved in a battle over narrative with the commercial and corporate press. And there is a third stream because people of color were systematically excluded for 200 years from both the commercial press and the dissidents and working men's press, they had to create their own voices. 1827, Freedom's Journal, John Russell and Samuel Cornish, the first black newspaper in the world. We wish to plead our own cause. Too long have others spoken for us. From the press and the pulpit, we have suffered much by being incorrectly represented. That's March of 1827. You could write that today, and it would still have resonance. Uh, and uh, uh, on to uh, great journalists like Mary Ann Shad Carey and Ida B. Wells uh, campaigning against lynching. Or I, Elias Boudno and the Cherokee Phoenix, the first Native American newspaper in the world in 1828 in Newachota, Georgia. Uh, to John Rollins Ridge, the Native American who founded the Sacramento Bee. Uh, a Cherokee was a founder of the Sacramento Bee that became the, the basis of the McClask uh, McClaskey chain. The Golden Hills News, 1854, the first Chinese language newspaper in the United States, or the work of Wong Ching Fu, founder of the uh, Chinese American in 1883, uh, right here in New York City. There were over 25 Chinese language newspapers in the United States before the 20th century. There were hundreds of Spanish-speaking papers in the country. Uh, and, and, uh, uh, and of course, in the Spanish language press, there's an enormous radical tradition, not just a, a news tradition, a radical news tradition, from uh, Enrique Salazar, who founded La Voz del Pueblo in, uh, in Las Vegas, New Mexico in the 1890s, to um, uh, Jose Agustin Quintero, who founded El Ranchero in 1855 in San Antonio, uh, to um, Jose Martí, one of the really great journalists uh, covering the United States. He lived in New York City for 15 years and wrote for Latin American papers, some of the most un unbelievably great news coverage of the United States, <laughs> written in Spanish by the founding father of Cuba, <laughs> Jose Martí to Ricardo Flores Magón, uh, the anarchist, uh, with his paper, Regeneración, uh, that was published throughout the Southwest here and was really the precursor of what became the Mexican Revolution, to Jovita Idar, uh, the great Mexican-American uh, in Laredo, Texas, who edited La Cronica and who campaigned against the lynching of Mexicans and against these, the segregation of Mexican schools and of the lack of the, the, the stealing of the land of Mexicans by the Anglo settlers. Two more modern times, Jesus Colon, Colon uh, who for decades wrote a column for the Daily Worker, the, the official Communist Party paper here in the United States. He was a columnist in the, for the Daily Worker in the 1950s. So there is a long tradition of journalists of the Latino community who not only covered the news of the community, but covered it from a radical perspective. Uh, but to get back to this issue of objectivity and what's real journalism, the fact is the press in the US have always been partisan and subjective in their chronicling of reality. In fact, it was Upton Sinclair's devastating exposure of press corruption in his classic book, The Brass Check, and public revulsion over misinformation by the giant newspaper chains that gave rise in the early 1900s to journalism schools like this one and to organizations like the American Society of Newspaper Editors that sought to establish basic standards of journalism. And it was only in the aftermath of World War II and the creation of the Hutchins Commission that any principles of fair and comprehensive coverage of news events 
even began to be promulgated widely or that the FCC's fairness doctrine began to be implemented. It was Walter Lippmann, perhaps the most influential journalist of the 20th century, who first dissected the nonsense of objective journalism and first raised the issue of stereotyping in the press. As we say in our, in our book, it is the job of the modern journalist to witness events in the wider world and then convey those events and their meaning to the rest of us as quickly as possible. But such reports are fraught with weaknesses inherent to each reporter's own perception of reality, the subjectivity that so often springs from upbringing, education, class, race, religion, and gender. The less the journalist knows about the event or the subject at hand, the more likely he or she is to produce a crude or blurred representation of it. Those reports are then further filtered by editors and publishers who get to decide which portions of the reporter's dispatch are newsworthy and will survive and which will disappear in the editing process. Lippmann warned 100 years ago, his book Public Opinion was written in, uh, in 1922, he warned 100 years ago of the distortions that were inherent in such a process. To quote Lippmann, for the most part, we do not first see and then define. We define first and then see. In the great blooming, buzzing confusion of the outer world, we pick out what our culture has already defined for us. And we tend to perceive that which we have picked out in, in the form stereotyped for us by our culture. And we are deluding ourselves uh, if we think that uh, chronicling of events occurs in any other way. As you can imagine, my views did not always sit well with my editors in the commercial press. And over the decades, even as I kept breaking major stories that others had ignored, and even if they conceded the accuracy of my reporting, they could, uh, they could not accept my advocacy bent. In fact, I must be the only reporter in mainstream journal journalism with an extensive rap sheet, having been arrested about a dozen times over four decades, the 60s, 70s, 80s, and 90s, on a variety of criminal of charges, criminal trespass, contempt of court, marijuana possession, inciting to riot, draft evasion, all except for the marijuana bust related to political protests. Mike McAlary often joked to me, Mike was a colleague of mine, a Pulitzer Prize winner at the New York Daily News who died very young in his 40s. Mike often joked to me that one day he went into the old Daily News library and came across the paper's clips on my radical days. This was when papers still had massive dusty files of yellow cutout articles stuffed into pocket folders under various subjects and names. Uh, you know, now, of course, you just do a Google search. And uh, uh, the clip folder that he found was titled Juan Gonzalez Revolutionary. But by then, someone had crossed out revolutionary and changed it to Daily News Columnist. <laughs> Just before 1990, Mac and I, uh, as two star columnists at the news, were both sent along with a reporter and a photographer to cover the US invasion of Panama. Mac and the others chose to be embedded with our military and tell their story. And I, because I was the only one who spoke Spanish and because I knew from the start that this was an illegal invasion of a country that posed no threat to the United States, made my way into the barrios of Panama City to report on the invasion's impact on the Panamanian people. And that brings me to the issue of war. Very timely issue today. Throughout the history of civilization, Governments have had to justify wars to their people. How else could they get the people to send their sons and daughters to the front to fight? But in every war, at least one side is lying to its people, and quite often both are. And the press has always been essential for whipping up public hysteria for war. From the Patriot Press printers of the American Revolution, Ben Franklin, Benjamin Eades, Sam Adams, 
to the war press of New Orleans that was the one that pushed for the U.S. Uh, to get involved in the war with Mexico, to the yellow press of the Spanish-American War, to the Committee on Public Information that spread worldwide propaganda for the First World War, uh, all the Panama-like imperialist interventions of our country in Nicaragua, in the Dominican Republic, in Cuba, in Vietnam, Grenada, Af Iraq, Afghanistan, and today, Ukraine. Our commercial press inevitably rally round the flag. The press releases and the narrative of our generals and politicians, and they rarely shine light on the voices of peacemakers or even to legitimate questions raised by those opposed to our wars. It is in, in time of war that journalists face their greatest challenge. And having the courage to question or oppose your own government's actions in war is the ultimate test of independent journalism. The various times I did so during the Iran hostage crisis, during the Panama invasion, during the Iraq war, were among the most difficult periods of my career. But having been steeled by those early experiences in the Columbia strike and on the streets of East Harlem with the Lords, it was not difficult to withstand efforts to intimidate me or dismiss my reporting by those who felt they were only doing their job. Most of my reporting, however, has not been about such weighty issues of race, war, and politics, but about individuals seeking a better life and seeking some form of justice. When I began writing my column for the Daily News in 1987, I had to decide what my particular approach would be. In a city brimming with extraordinary writers, uh, Jimmy Breslin, Mary Kempton, Pete Hamill, Russell Baker, Sidney Schamberg, and awash with many able young writers, my modest contribution, I decided, would be a voice from another part of New York, not writing about outcast neighborhoods, but from them, not simply to entertain, but to change, not after the fact, but before it, when coverage could still make a difference. In daily news writing, time becomes both an enemy and an ally. What you lose in the chance to chisel and refine in the, for the relative few, you gain in the opportunity to influence and energize the many. I sought to use as many of my columns as possible to probe the injustices visited upon the powerless. Yes, the rich and the famous are also victims on occasion, but they have so many politicians, lobbyists, lawyers, gossip columnists, even editorial boards, ready to jump to their defense that they will always do fine without my help. I preferred the desperate, unknown reader who came to me because he or she has gone everywhere else and no one would listen. More often than not, I came across unexpected gems, human beings whose tragedies illuminated the landscape and whose courage hopefully inspired the reader to believe that there is indeed some greater good served by a free press than just chronicling or influencing the ostering of one group of politicians by another. So that's been my journey. A short sketch of what I tried to do with the skills Ms. Bonagura gave me, with the radical views of the world I first learned here at Columbia in the midst of the 68 strike, and with the courage and heart the Lords exemplified. And the main lesson of it all, never stop believing a better world is possible when you dare to struggle for it, but strive to do so with the knowledge of the efforts that paved the way for you, with the humility to learn from your mistakes, and as the great Chuck Stone counseled, remember to document everything. Thank you. Well, that was a wonderful uh, talk from Juan. Um, now uh, we're going to move to the panel portion of the program, and I'm going to introduce uh, <coughs> two discussants. Nina Alvarez is a journalist documentarian and video f uh, photographer. Her 25-year career began at ABC News, where she was a uh, production assistant on acclaimed documentary series Turning Point, went on to work in Miami uh, Bureau covering news in the Southeast US and Latin America. Her work with the uh, network's top honor talent was broadcast on World News Tonight with Peter Jennings, Good Morning America, 
from 2015 to 17, she was also a senior producer at the Fusion Netflix investigative series Naked Truth, um, which was recognized with the Alfred I. DuPont Columbia Journalism Award. Alvarez is currently a senior editor of investigative projects at Futura Muter Group and also a member of the faculty here at uh, Columbia Journalism School. Um, if you want to come up, and uh, also Claudia, uh, Claudio, I'm sorry, <laughs> is misspelled here, uh, Lomnitz, uh, anthropology professor here at Columbia, works in history, politics, and culture of Latin America, particularly Mexico, PhD from Stanford, 1987, first book, Evolución de una Sociedad Rural, 1982, was a study of politics and cultural change in Tepoztlan, Mexico. After that, developed an interest in uh, conceptualizing nation state as a cultural region, uh, which was explored in exits from the labyrinth culture and ideology in Mexico, Mexican national space. Uh, most recent book, uh, which Juan mentioned actually, there are two recent books, The Return of Comrade Ricardo Flores Magón, Detailed History of the Exile, on Exile and Ideology in Mexican Revolution, and most recent book, Nuestra America, My Family in, uh, in the Vertigo of Translation, I love that title, which is an essay on uh, Claudio's family history. So come up uh, now and join us. Now let me see if I can turn this on. I don't know if I... We're going to... Uh, oh yeah, okay, there we go. Sorry about that, it was a simple on switch. So um, I'm going to start with a question for Juan, and then I'm going to pass it on to our other two panelists. And that's what we're here for, to ask questions and have a brief conversation. Um, after we have this panel discussion, we'll have some time for questions from the audience. So Juan, you know, one of the things that uh, has been bugging me over the last few years uh, reminds me of the lessons that we've gotten from uh, the young lords. Uh, the Young Lords was a group that was aware that uh, aware of social class politics. At the same time, they were de developing an identity politics that sought solidarity with black and indigenous people. Why do you think these two strands of thought are so separated in the current moment, where people of color are often not considered part of the working class vote? Well, I, I think clearly, uh, in this country, as not only in the U.S., but in, in throughout um, uh, the industrialized world, uh, increasingly the, uh, the working class, especially those in the lower paid sectors of the working class, are increasingly people of color, whether you go to France or England or, uh, or, or the United States or Germany. That's the reality of the de developing of uh, the, uh, the multi cultural multiracial change in all of these f former colonial powers. Uh, and I think that um, uh, that people don't, often don't understand that. Uh, and uh, for instance, we saw it during the, the pandemic, the uh, essential workers. <laughs> Who were the essential workers, <laughs> right? Aside from the doc the people in the healthcare system, it was all the people who were forced to work uh, by their employers, uh, and uh, and who were whether they were producing food, whether they were uh, uh, whether they were the, the maintenance people in in a lot of these uh, a lot of these hospitals, they had to work, uh, and uh, so I think that the the way that what I believe has happened, unfortunately, is that there's been a, in Lords we never divorced race from class. We always understood that they were uh, interrelated uh, and that what often happens in national movements is that the, the upper classes of every nationality or every racial group have a common interest in struggling against uh, racial bias, but they don't necessarily have a class interest in changing the system. Uh, and so they will want to focus uh, the main uh, emphasis on the racial uh, oppression and minimize uh, the class oppression. We in the Lords always said that, hey, there is racism within the Latino community. No doubt about that. There's bias within the Latino community. Guess what? 
In a racist society, everyone is imbued with racism. You cannot escape it. Uh, the question then becomes, what is the difference between uh, the structural racism imposed by the society and the biases inculcated into individuals as a result of living in the society? Uh, uh, one is a contradiction of oppression, the other is uh, are bi individual biases that are inculcated into people but can be educated out. And so I think what's happened a lot is that the, bat the, the fight around uh, uh, racism, especially in the last few years, has been hijacked by uh, the middle and the upper classes. Uh, and and uh, as, as I say, uh, we, have, we have the growth of what's called a diversity what is it, DI, diversity, equity, and inclusion industry <laughs> that has developed in this country. There are lots of people making money off of counseling you uh, how to deal with diversity, equity, and inclusion, uh, when the reality is that the, the, the real oppression, <laughs> whether you're African American, Latino, Asian American, is a class oppression that you feel on a day-to-day -day basis in your ability to survive, to, to feed your family. And, that, and so we, we, we have to pay attention and deal with and contend with F, uh, uh, racial discrimination, but in the Lords, we always understood there was a difference uh, between that structural uh, racism and the individual biases that people inevitably fall into and that they have to be educated out of. Yeah, well, you know, I'm so glad I asked you that because I've been thinking about that for a while and uh, you do resonate with, um, you know, the recent book, uh, Elite Capture, and um, terms like neoliberal multiculturalism, um, which, you know, uh, the curtain, uh, the Biden administration is still taking so much flack for um, being perceived as only supporting that kind of neoliberal multiculturalism, and and it, it gets stuck into this false binary uh, about class. So um, why don't we uh, turn to Nina, who uh, may have a question? Uh, Nina Alvarez. <coughs> so I was especially struck when you were talking about. Um, the narratives that, and objectivity, right? Objectivity and the narratives that are accepted. And I think that's still true today, where if, uh, you know, we here at the journalism school, we do have discussions about advocacy and how do you, if you're part of a community, are you able to cover it uh, objectively? Um, there's always that suspicion that you have an agenda. You know, that certainly I fa faced this during my career in mainstream media. Um, what do we need to do as journalists to, um, to, to break down that perception? You know, I don't think anyone worries about white people covering white communities but they seem to be worried about us covering our own communities and that somehow we're going to advocate or present a, a uh, biased picture. Yeah, well, you're right that uh, we haven't fully overcome that. There's been a little progress, but you know, progress is not a straight line. You, you know, in a period of time you go up, and then there is a reaction and you go back. And then you gotta go back up and go back. So I remember back in the uh, early 80s, uh, couple, myself and two African-American reporters at the Philadelphia Daily News convinced the editors to allow us to do a, a series of articles on the gentrification that was occurring in inner city Philadelphia. Uh, in uh, all, all these neighborhoods that were once largely African American, Latino, in South Philly, and in uh, uh, in uh, the art museum area, and other areas were being increasingly gentrified, uh, Northern Liberties, and and uh, so the team was created, and immediately there was an uproar by the white reporters. Why are you assigning two African Americans and one Latino to write this story? Uh, uh, th th that's going to be a biased story. So they actually fought to get at least one white reporter onto our group. Now, of course, nobody else had thought about doing this story. You know, we the ones that had come up with the idea. Uh, and we eventually did this series and it won a bunch of prizes. And, uh, but it was the idea that you assume that what has happened in the past did not have a, agendas, you know, was, was uh, necessarily objective. Uh, and that now, because this, uh, this one uh, group 
of non-white reporters that decided to work together on a project that somehow they were suspect. Uh, so I think this is a constant uh, problem that we, uh, 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 we deal with. Uh, and I think that um, even people forget that the diversification of media, the, what we have, it's, it's still nothing compared to what the, 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 the numbers in the population, demographics of the population. But the little we have was, was a result of struggle. Right? The reason Ed Bradley got on TV and Gil Noble got on TV and Connie Chung got on TV and Geraldo Rivera got on TV uh, in the mid to late 1970s is because between 1970 and 1973, there was the most massive revolution in American uh, broadcasting uh, ever. There were over 350 licensed challenges to the FCC licenses of television and radio stations around the country by black and Latino community groups who picketed the stations, who filed complaints against the FCC and challenged the licenses because those stations were not reporting and representing the entirety of the community that they were serving. So it, the only reason the industry reformed because a lot of these license challenges were beginning to be successful. <laughs> And they were going to lose their licenses. So they said, oh, we got to find, we got to hire some African Americans. We got to hire some Latinos. We got to do a public interest show on Sunday morning at 6 a.m., you know, about the, the black community or, uh, or uh, about the Latino community. And they only did it as a result of public pressure. And as soon as the public pressure died down, uh, the stations pulled back. Uh, and uh, the reason why many of the newspapers, in uh, the major newspapers, uh, began to diversify their coverage was again, struggle. The Washington Post had a major racial discrimination lawsuit. The New York Times, the, and it was a, a Puerto Rican, Belinda Rosario, Rosario v. the New York Times. Uh, the Associated Press had a discrimination suit, the Daily News had a discrimination suit. So in fact, the Daily News was the only one that actually went to trial. All the others settled out of court because they didn't want to deal with the headache. The Daily News went to trial and lost and had to pay $3.2 million to six uh, black reporters who were the plaintiffs in that lawsuit for historic discrimination. So all of these media institutions only changed as a result of public and legal pressure. And you've got to constantly keep the pressure on them or they'll go back to their old ways. It's easy to fall back. Uh, uh, to the ways you were doing things before. Um, Claudio. Yeah, well first uh, I kind of wanted to say a little bit of wow I, I, and uh, thank you for that, uh, for that reflection and that personal reflection which is extremely moving I thought but also um, <clears throat> full of lessons and with uh, uh, amazing historical depth as well. Um, so thanks, and it's a privilege to, to have a chance to, to talk with you about these things today. Um, I had two kinds of questions, but maybe I'll start with one, which is the, in, in the history of Latino and Latin American uh, journalism that is part of the same history, actually, you mentioned Marti, who was the first l foreign correspondent in Latin America, uh, and this developed here in New York. Uh, uh, Ricardo Flores Maguon did a good chunk of his career as an exile uh, here in Mexico, in the U.S. Um, <clears throat> um, but many of the of the main um, uh, intellectuals in Latin America have chosen to be involved in journalism, uh, principally in journalism, that is, they're, they're mainly journalists, and at the same time, they're sort of teachers. They're teachers, uh, <clears throat> sometimes they aspire to be, uh, it was uh, Jose Carlos Mariate, another example, uh, a you know, great uh, Peruvian in intellectual who, if you want to understand his philosophy, you have to read him as a journalist. Uh, so I wanted to ask you a little bit about the relationship between journalism and teaching. You started with a homage to your teacher. What, how do you see that connection already as a, as a journalist? Yeah, well, I think that being a, a journalist is a great job. You get paid to learn. 
And basically, every day you learn something new, you know. And if you and if you dedicate yourself to it, you learn a lot. And I think then what you have to do is then distill what you learn to a broader public. So you are basically telling people what you've learned. <laughs> That's what it comes down to. And uh, and uh, so I guess it is. I never thought of it that way, but it is a uh, it is a, a teaching process that goes on. And of course, you didn't uh, mention. Uh, Garcia Marquez, who also was, uh, was in fact, one of his first great s stories was the Diary of a Shipwrecked Sailor, which was all, which was a newspaper series that he wrote, uh, and uh, about a guy who was uh, left at sea for I think it was months at a time, and then he was finally found and became a folk hero in uh, in Colombia. And um, so yeah, there there there's definitely been a long tradition. I, I think of uh, in, in Puerto Rico. Uh, Another mentor of mine, uh, uh, Juan Manuel Garcia Pasalacua, who was also one of these people who was constantly writing commentaries but teaching the people of Puerto Rico their history and, and what had happened behind the scenes when they were at work and they didn't know what was going on in Washington. Or He was the one who, who wrote those stories and was a celebrated and, uh, uh, and respected journalist by all sides. He was the only guy who could talk to pro-statehooders uh, uh, and uh, and pro populares, and at the same time, go and uh, interview the FALN members or the macheteros <laughs> in the hiding, and all of them respected him because they knew that he would provide an accurate picture of what was going on in their battles. So that's, there is a long history in Latin America of the journalist as a sort of a, of a teacher and uh, an educator. Yeah. Okay, I'm going to ask. Um, <coughs> Another question, and then when I'm done with mine, I mean, you guys should just jump in and to make the thing a little more spontaneous. Um, so another thing that's been bugging me is uh, this: <laughs> there's there's been a lot of focus lately on political reporting about how the Latino vote is shifting to the Republican Party, um, despite the fact that the numbers in most cases show only incremental gains that don't always hold. In in fact, like recently, there's on the midterm election, there was a report saying that in the border states, which is where most of this Republican trend is happening, it didn't really increase all that much. Um, does this show a flaw in how some trends, despite their basis in objective reporting, are overemphasized by the mainstream media? Yeah, uh, I think there's too much of a fixation on data. <laughs> Uh, you know, and what you can what you can prove as a, as a result of your data analysis, uh, and I uh, here's the simple fact, and I, I talk about this in Harvest of Empire. It has helped through throughout the entire history of Latino political participation in the United States. The numbers have been, uh, in terms of political affiliation, have basically been unchanged. One third of Latinos tend to vote Republican. Two thirds tend to vote Democratic. Uh, that hasn't changed since the 1960 presidential election uh, between Nixon and, and Kennedy. Yes, there are incremental changes if you get up above, uh, for instance, uh, John McCain got 27 percent, Romney got about 28 percent of the vote. Um, Ronald Reagan got 40 percent of the Latino vote. That was a high uh, in, when he ran for president. George Bush got, I think, as high as 44 percent in his second run for president. Uh, and um, so, but that's, that's the range, from about 25% to 40%, but the average is about 30%. It hasn't changed, all right? So, uh, yes, uh, Trump was about the middle of the pack uh, when he ran for president. And yes, there'll be some fluctuation, because the Latino community has never been a monolith. It, again, it has class distinctions. Uh, we're seeing, uh, for instance, the fastest growing Latino group in the United States right now is Venezuelans. Uh, uh, and there's a huge increase in the number of Venezuelans in South Florida. They're going to be, they're going to tend to be from more middle class families of fleeing the, the situation there, and they're going to tend to vote more as Cuban migrants did in the past. But even among others, uh, the Colombian migration was a middle class migration for many years. Uh, the, uh, uh, so depending on the nationality and when people come, their class orientation is different. So you can't expect that there's going to be a mon uh, Latinos are going to function as a monolith. Uh, the other thing about the Texas situation is obviously there's been a huge increase in border security industry in the Southwest, uh, the tripling of border patrol agents, 
Who do you think most of those Border Patrol agents are? <laughs> They're Latinos who live in South Texas, you know, and they have family and they depend on the industry <laughs> to control the border. So there's a growth industry along the border in, uh, in shutting down uh, uh, the Mexican migration from Mexico. So that all, all of that influences how votes occur. But the fundamental uh, situation has not changed which is that oh, the overwhelming majority of Latinos in the United States are working class. Uh, the Puerto Rican migration has changed. So now it's middle class Puerto Ricans that are coming. It's not working class anymore. It's doctors, it's, it's lawyers, it's engineers who can't find jobs in Puerto Rico. So they're going to tend to vote more conservative in, in central Florida than other Puerto Ricans who came in the past. Uh, if, if you analyze the class distinctions, you'll find a lot more of what's going on. The main thing that people are missing it's not the fluctuations from 30% to 32% uh, or to 28%, it's the growth of the vote. That's the key, the, that the, 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 the vote is growing so rapidly and is so much bigger than it was before that two thirds of a much bigger vote <laughs> Uh, is more votes, <laughs> you know, and so I, I think you're mi there, the, all these analyses are missing the point. The, the vote is growing and will continue to grow for years to come, and, and it's the numbers, it's not the particular breakdown at any, at any one time. Uh, and then, of course, in local races, uh, it changes too. Ju Rudy Giuliani got 40% of the Latino vote twice when he ran for mayor. Uh, Richard Reardon got 40% of the Mexican vote uh, when he ran for, uh, for mayor. Uh, so at the local level, it even changes to some degree even more. But you got to look at the overall trends and, the, and also the class composition of the vote to get a better picture. Thank you for that. Still there? So the narrative of uh, all these, um, you know, the effort to provide a path to citizenship for all of these people coming into the country or who are already here, that they're all going to become Democrats. Is that, is that false? I think that, uh, well, to the, uh, I think they'll remember who helped them get their citizenship, <laughs> you know, and uh, so I think that's going to have a big impact. Look, look the, the reason why we haven't had comprehensive immigration reform now after 15 years or so is because that's a big issue. You're really determining who gets to be an American in the 21st century. That's what's at the heart of this thing. Uh, and some people are frightened by what they see <laughs> uh, is uh, where people are coming from. Uh, and they're afraid that the world that they knew will be no more. And so they're trying to hold it back. But the reality is you can't hold it back. The United States has a labor shortage. <laughs> doesn't have a labor surplus, it has a labor shortage. Uh, there aren't enough people to fill jobs and the white population of the country continues to age. Uh, and so therefore, who's going to run this society? Who's gonna to contribute to social security? Who's gonna fill all the jobs? They're only gonna come from Africa, Asia, and Latin America unless they create a whole new uh, express pipeline from Ukraine and, uh, and Eastern Europe. Uh, uh, to uh, uh, to fill uh, to fill those jobs, they're only going to come from Asia, Africa, and Latin America, uh, and it's not just us. It's France, it's England, it's Germany. They're all dealing with the same issue. The colonial powers expected that they could extract all the wealth of Asia, Africa, and Latin America and never have to deal with the people. It was a miscalculation. Once you establish routes of trade, once you establish lines of communication, once you establish ties between, you, you, you draft your colonial subjects into your wars to fight your wars. Once you create those relationships, the people are following the wealth. And uh, it's the harvest, that's why I call my book The Harvest of the Empire. It was the unintended harvest of the empire. Uh, the empire never expected its colonial subjects to come to the metropolis, and now they're trying to figure out what the hell to do about it. Well, you know, they, what's, the, what's, the, the, what's the horses out of the barn? Uh, uh, and uh, uh, so I think that's, th that's the reality. But I got questions for you. Nina, I want to ask you, because you worked on, I, I mentioned the PBS, uh, the great uh, series, the six-part series of PBS on Latino Americans. What impressed me most about that series, it was mostly Latino producers, uh, and they really felt that they wanted to tell this story. And I'm wondering, 
did you have any problems with PBS as you were trying to put that series together, <laughs> you know, to get the kind of narrative that you wanted out in that series? Let's see, there's like six cameras in here. <laughs> oh, but you're not working for PBS now, right? Oh, well, you could in the future. Uh, uh, I actually <laughs> am. Oh, you are. Okay. <laughs> so, right. But let me see how I can answer this question. Um, yes, yeah, so the, the documentary that I produced was the migrations from uh, Puerto Rico, Dominican Republic, and Cuba following World War II. And um, it was a it, it just amazing story. We, we found um, people who had their own personal stories to tell. Uh, you were interviewed for that film, and I think you were in a few of them. Um, and I think it was a, I took a lot of my cues from, I, I've very much aligned my thinking with your thinking in, in Harvest of Empire in that for me the, the theme that connected these three migrations after World War, World War II was the, um, the push factors and the United States role in creating these push factors. And I thought that that was a narrative that we weren't seeing. We were used to seeing the arrival story and the American dream narrative and just, uh, you know, Latinos as, as very happy, hardworking people who suffered racism um, and all of that might be true, but there were, there were circumstances that drove those migrations that were, um, uh, Pivotal. I mean, you know, just devastating relationships and support of, uh, you know, in the Dominican Republic, sending in Marines in Cuba, uh, uh, basically encouraging a migration after the Cuban Revolution, um, and uh, Puerto Rico. We needed the labor, and and there were these theories that. Puerto Rico would develop if you just, you know, there were just too many people on the island, so let's bring them over here. Um, and, and actually, PBS's response was a little bit um, concerning because, you know, it is run by white people mostly. And I think they were very used to a narrative that they're comfortable with. They're comfortable with the salsa music. They're comfortable with, um, you know, that partying narrative and that hardworking narrative and that pulling themselves up by their bootstraps narrative and not the narrative of the um, circumstances that involve the US government. So I think that was a, that was a discussion that was at times uncomfortable, <laughs> but I think ultimately they came around. I did have to put in a little bit of salsa, um, <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> You know, just to please some people and funders, you know, remember funders, you know, they, it's very hard, even for a PBS audience, to accept narratives that aren't what they're used to hearing and used to, or, or comfortable with. Was that yeah, close good. enough? <laughs> I, I also want to ask Claudio, uh, you, that book of yours I mentioned is fantastic. If you haven't read it, folks should read it. Uh, 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 and uh, and Ricardo Flores Magón, who is really one of the unheralded figures, uh, he died in uh, federal prison right here in the United States. He was constantly jailed by the United States, uh, and yet he's considered a, a national hero in Mexico. And uh, and he was an anarchist. And 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 people don't realize that there's a long tradition of anarchism uh, in Latin America. And uh, and uh, there were many anarchists. Uh, I think of Pedro Esteve, who, who was a, Spani a Spaniard, who, who created the first Spanish language newspaper in New Jersey. He was part of the anarchist movement in the early 20th century. But what made you decide to write about Ricardo? <laughs> well, thanks, thanks for, the, for the chance to talk about it. I started working, uh, I, I was working on border crossings at the, uh, when the US-Mexico uh, border became, uh, as, as a, has been said, moved from being a frontier to being a border. When it was settled, I started looking at border crossings and the writings of different border crossers, a couple of whom were journalists. One of them, James Creelman from the Pulitzer uh, 
thing, did a famous uh, interview with Porfirio Diaz in 1909, which was seen as part of the trigger for the Mexican, involuntarily, because it was a, a peon to, uh, to, uh, to Diaz. Uh, but the other piece was a journalist, John Kenneth Turner. You mentioned uh, some of the folks that he, he was a muckraker and he was a socialist. And th he produced this set of articles for the American magazine that later got published as a book called Mexi Mexi Barbarous Mexico, and which is a, a tremendous uh, reportage. And when I started looking at it as a historian, I thought, you know, this is a weird book because these are weird r because they're not, they're different from anything that any Mexican was writing at the time, and they're different from anything that any American reporter was writing at the time. And so I started in, in re researching that, and it became clear all of a sudden that it had been co-produced between Turner and uh, a Mexican lawyer and journalist called Lázaro Gutiérrez de Lara, who had been exiled here. So I started thinking, well, you know, this friendship is actually accounts for a real transformation in the way of writing. So I started trying to write a book about that. And I thought, well, I'll write a book about the connection between friendship, in transnational friendship, and the transformation of Mexican, Mexican-American culture around the time of the Mexican Revolution. Of course, both of these figures were closely tied to Ricardo Flores Magón and the whole group. And so I started discovering slowly that you could reread the whole story of that movement of the Mexican liberal, so-called Mexican Liberal Party, which was a, an anarchist group, uh, a, or or a socialist group, partly socialist, partly anarchist, a, through the lens of uh, collaborations and friendships, a, mostly between Americans and Mexicans, sometimes other folks. Uh, uh, as well, and that's how I started. Got into. I just dropped the other book, and I and I wrote this one. And, and uh, for people who don't know, how is Flores Magón regarded in Mexico? F Flores Magón in Mexico is regarding it, regarded, I think, rightly as the original ideologue of the whole Mexican Revolution, um, a, and also as a little bit of a saint. Sometimes he's seen a little bit as a as a saint because, like many of these anarchist figures there's a side of it that is kind of ascetic. I mean, this guy is just, just a, a completely unrelenting, uh, unrelenting in the sense of un uncorruptible. They offered him they jobs, the vice presidency of Mexico. At a certain point, he turned everything down. He lived very poorly all of his life and was in jail multiple times in Mexico first and then in the US until he died in prison. So he's seen a, a bit of, also as a martyr. Um, um, but the, in addition to the kind of his, um, let's say, example as a certain kind of political leader, there is the actual writing in the newspaper itself, which is really remarkable. And so you still have students. I discovered him as a student in Mexico, and a lot of people discover him as a student uh, there uh, because the writing is some of the best that, that there has been. So mm -hmm. The same way with Martí. If you've never read Jose Martí, you are losing out, <laughs> okay? Uh, I think, was it, was it Phil Foner produced a, 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 a translation of a book of, of, his, uh, of his writings? And, uh, you gotta read Martí. Uh, there's an English version of some of his writings. He wrote about the, the opening of the Brooklyn Bridge. He, he wrote about lynchings in the United States. He wrote about the Haymarket Square uh, 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 events. Uh, he wrote about oppression of Native Americans, and he was writing for Latin America <laughs> in Spanish as going across the United States, writing articles about the U.S. Uh, and, but, I mean, but really good writing. We're not talking about, you know, everyday stuff. This is like uh, heavy-duty writing. And uh, so, yeah, I think that was always my sense. We represent a different tradition, <laughs> you know. Uh, uh, and uh, once you have a sense of what the tradition of journalism in Latin America and among Latinos has been, you feel stronger in your sense that, hey, your way is not the only way, <laughs> right? Uh, and there are other ways to practice journalism, and you cannot dominate or tell us how we're going to practice journalism. Uh, and I think that's, you know, that's a really, and Flores Magón is just one, one of many examples uh, uh, of that. Yeah. Uh, I, I want to ask one more question, and then maybe um, we can have people ask questions. There's a microphone there. 
You know, I, I was actually uh, talking with Felipe Luciano the other day because he came to this event that was here with uh, Eddie Palmieri, and I told him that, you know, when I saw the Young Lords, it was something that, you know, I was a little younger, and and it really sort of set the my vision for you know what I what I felt was important about life, and and it was just the harbinger of change. You know, it was just this announcement of change. And I felt like the rest of my life was going to be this great era of change. And then, you know, we have this Republican reaction beginning with Reagan and everything like that. And slowly, you know, it's just, you know, reversal after reversal. And now, you know, maybe affirmative action gone, you know. How does one keep the optimism of your era alive? Well, I think, uh, first of all, um, a lot of young people say, well, how come, you know, we don't have the kind of movements? Well, you, there are movements. There are strong movements uh, that um, have developed in, in recent years, but they tend to rise and fall because there's no commitment to the or organizations that carry from the ebbs and flows of any movement. You've, you've got to have strong organizations, uh, and uh, that's important. Uh, and the, everyone wants to be an individual lead, leader or individual activist. No one wants to have a collective group. The thing that made the Lords really uh, powerful was that we had a whole bunch of really terrific people all in one organization. Uh, and we managed, even though we had major, major battles and fights among ourselves, we managed to stay together. It wasn't a long time, but if we had stayed together longer, we would have been done a lot more. So uh, I think it's, uh, you know, uh, uh, what I believe, as, as I've so often said, we didn't liberate Puerto Rico. We didn't leave many institutions behind, although there were a few. Luis Garna Costa built a tremendous organization in Brooklyn, a former young lord. Uh, and um, we didn't leave many institutions behind, but we changed the minds of a generation about how to see the potential to make change. And that was, we opened up the minds. We didn't, as I said, we didn't liberate Puerto Rico, we liberated our minds. Uh, and uh, we were able to, uh, and I've been amazed at the accomplishments of people who were in the Young Lords. Uh, and who, what they went on to, wherever they went, they went on to be leaders in their fields. Whether it was in the labor movement, whether it was in academia. With, uh, we recruited a guy by the name of Nelson uh, Merced to the Young Lords in Puerto Rico. He'd just come out of the Vietnam War. He'd been in the Navy. He was all mixed up. And you know, he joined the Young Lords in, uh, in Puerto Rico. Uh, he was with us for about a year. Then we had some political differences. Some people began to think he was a police agent. And we expelled him. Erroneously, that happens a lot in these organizations. We expelled him. Uh, and uh, Nelson moved to Massachusetts. Uh, he later uh, founded a housing organization, uh, built the, the biggest housing organization uh, in Boston among the Latino community, Inquilinos Boricuas en Acción. Uh, he later ran for state representative, uh, was the first Latino elected in the state legislature of Massachusetts, uh, and from a largely African-American district. <laughs> right? uh, and uh, he started with us in the Lords when he came out. Uh, uh, there, there were all of these folks. Uh, I recently received an email, which I, this is an accomplishment that I didn't even know anything about. Mickey Melendez sent me this email, one of our, our Young Lord original founders, uh, that a guy by the name of Emilio Carrillo, I don't know if any of you know Emilio Carrillo, he was a doctor, he was the head of the Health and Hospitals Corporation under uh, David Dinkins. Uh, he was a vice president of Columbia Presbyterian. He's had a distinguished medical career. So Emilio Carrillo sends me this email, and he says, Juan, you may not remember this, but back in 1970, I was talking with you on a bus uh, because I had just was trying to decide where to go to medical school. And, uh, and, uh, and you told me, go to Boston, because he'd been, he'd been accepted at, at Harvard, and uh, go to Boston because Luis Garden, who's a young lord, is starting a chapter there of the young lords in Boston, and he could really use some help. Uh, so, uh, so he said, well, he said, I took your advice, I went to Boston, you know, uh, graduated from medical school, we built a group called the Puerto Rican, um, uh, 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 what's it called? 
Puerto Rican um, uh, health organization. Uh, and uh, it later became the Latino Health Organization to help train uh, young Puerto Ricans and Latinos uh, to go to medical school and to become doctors. He said, uh, this month we're celebrating the 50th anniversary of an organization, uh, of that organization. Uh, over 500 people will be attending. Uh, and, um, and he said, and I want you to know that uh, it was the inspiration of Luis, because Luis had just recently died. Uh, he, he uh, Luis Garden had died, uh, uh, and the Lords, that is responsible for hundreds of young Latinos being able to go to medical school and become doctors and go back to serve in their community. And so I just wanted to thank you. Now this is something I knew nothing about until just a few, about a month or two ago, uh, this story from Emilio Carrillo. That's what I mean, that we affected the way that people saw that you could change society. And, it, uh, and if the organization fell apart, the people's minds did not. They took whatever they learned to wherever they went and they became leaders uh, uh, in their own organizations. Uh, and there were so many of them, uh, not just Iris Morales, but you know, uh, Sonia Ivany, who was the first woman, the Young Lords, who be, became one of the top officials in the New York State Federation of Labor. Midna Martinez, who became a family court judge in New York, just retired uh, from being a judge for many years. Uh, all these people who went on to do great things only because they knew, they learned in the Lords not to be afraid to go against the current. Uh, and to challenge orthodoxy and to think for yourself and to insist on serving other people. So I think that's the great contribution that we uh, you know, have. We had a great group of people. You can, look, you can't beat having a great group of people <laughs> to get things done. <laughs> you know? um, unless you, do you guys uh, want to have something you want to, uh, I'd like to invite someone to ask a question, just step right up to the mic. Dave, you can ask a question. Great program. Uh, oh, quick question, uh, Chicago pizza or New York pizza? <laughs> no, no, now you're gonna be, no, my main question, thank you, is uh, in your prognostication uh, for journalists, right, we see, uh, we, people are saying print is dead, there are less local uh, journalists. It basically, is it the internet is democratizing and that's our big opportunity? Or uh, how many journal, you, you headed uh, a group of journalists as well. So what do you see uh, for future journalism? There's a lot of turbulence. Uh, it's, um, uh, there's a lot of great stuff that's happened with the internet and with, um, uh, in terms of access to information. Uh, you can, you know, get news and information from around the world instantly, and uh, it's 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 amazing and it's wonderful what's happened. Uh, the, my problem is I mentioned this stuff about McLuhan. The way we ingest media affects our, our brains, and I see my students. A lot of my students don't read books anymore. They certainly don't. The journalism majors they don't read newspapers. You know, it's if it's not on their phone. <laughs> If it's not on their phone, they, they, they don't have time for it. And even on their phone, they only have time a few seconds because they gotta move on to something else. So that is rewiring our brains, and especially the, the brains of, of young people. Uh, and, uh, and I think uh, uh, that that's a problem. It, it, it's, the, it's the actual technology itself that is affecting how we digest and, uh, uh, and uh, uh, how we digest information and how we analyze. Uh, so I think that's the big problem. Uh, aside from the surveillance and, you know, I, I don't know how many of you have read Shoshona uh, Zubin's book, uh, uh, but you gotta read that book, uh, and uh, uh, Surveillance Capitalism. Uh, it's, it's a really important book in terms of what's happening uh, in the world today. Uh, and, um, but so I think that uh, there's a lot of positive, uh, in terms of jobs, uh, jobs are, you don't have the kind of jobs yet uh, because there's no economic basis for news uh, yet on, uh, uh, more and more uh, publications are going to subscription only. New York Times has succeeded tremendously in subscription. Over 50% of their revenue now comes from subscriptions, not from ads. So they've, they've solved it. But the Times is an international now paper. 
you know, they don't care about New York because they're getting subscriptions from all over the world now digitally. Uh, and uh, Washington Post has done the same thing, the, the Wall Street Journal. But most local newspapers, if you're going to if you're going to buy the Times or the, or the New York uh, or the Wall Street Journal or, or the Washington Post, you're not going to buy your local newspaper digitally also because it can, then it starts mounting up and uh, subscription prices. So I think that local media is a problem. That's why I, I, I'm a representative now on uh, the Rutgers University representative on a new uh, sort of pioneering approach that's been developed in New Jersey called the New Jersey Civic Information Consortium, where the state legislature is actually putting millions of dollars into a fund uh, and that Rutgers and some other organizations are funding projects to revive local news and information. Uh, and um, uh, and we're about to give out, I think, four and a half million dollars in the next next year uh, to a variety of efforts to try to re find ways and models to build local news, because that's the thing. Nas there'll always be somebody covering national news because the media have to help determine who's going to become president or congressman or whatever. But who's going to cover the local board of education, the local zoning, uh, the local zoning decisions? You know, the uh, the city council, the uh, um, uh, the planning board, all these l the major decisions are made affecting our lives locally and there's no one there to cover them. There's no one there in the state legislatures anywhere to cover what's going on, wh who's stealing what. Jimmy Breslin had a great line in one, one of his columns one time. He said, I got on a train to Albany yesterday along with all the other people who ride up there each day to steal. <laughs> right? And, uh, uh, and that's what happens at all these state capitals. There's incredible corruption in every state capital, and no one is covering it. No one is covering it uh, because there aren't enough reporters to pay them decent wages uh, for these media organizations, so they all cut their staffs. And uh, so we got to figure out a way. We got to figure the model. The nonprofit model is growing, uh, and the subscription model is growing, uh, but media is not free. Looks like May has a question. Thank you uh, for the wonderful talk and for this conversation. I really learned a lot. Um, I have a question about uh, kind of related to the objectivity uh, problem in mainstream media. Um, and I think you you expressed what I, I believe also is that every, every there's always an agenda and there's nothing that's purely objective. I'm worried about a related trend, which I call both sides-ism. Mm -hmm. I don't know if people remember the New York Times had a feature every Sunday for a little while after Trump was elected. This was going to be a place where nice things were said about Trump. It didn't last because I think there wasn't that many people who had nice things to say <laughs> about Trump. But I think this is something that um, I see, especially in the Times, uh, more so than even some other major newspapers and it's a little different from the it's a way of being objective but it's a way of actually being very subjective by treating all views as equal so I wonder if you could comment on this both sidesism and how do we combat it yeah I think that that, that is a, a major problem and I, I think the issue is again you can mention or or put forth a, an argument of of a, a contending argument in a story, but if your own investigation of that uh, uh, of that story uh, has um, has shown that that uh, that that view doesn't have legitimacy, that doesn't mean you have to give that argument equal time <laughs> with uh, with uh, the facts that you're presenting. Uh, you can't ignore it. <laughs> you can't ignore it. But you're you're paid as a journalist to uh, not. Uh, Report and interpret. I mean, I, I was I used to do a a, a, a um, an exercise with my students where I would ask them to interview each other, uh, and um, and then see because you know whenever you interview somebody, you might do an hour long interview. You're gonna choose two quotes out of that hour long interview to put into your story. Uh, the choice is where the subjectivity comes in. What do you believe is the most important thing that that person said in an hour? They may think something else is, uh, is important. 
you might think this is important and someone else who sits in on the same interview might decide something else is important. Uh, you can't, you cannot avoid that. If your, your, your choices are gonna be determined by how you grew up, what your class situation is, what your religion is, where, all that stuff comes into play in your choices. And it's not, there's nothing wrong about that. That's just the facts of how people perceive reality. Uh, and all you do is you say, okay, uh, I know that this publication has this perspective. I read them to see what they're gonna say, and then I'll read another publication or another news site to get a different perspective. Don't expect every site to give all perspectives, because it's not gonna happen. Uh, and uh, the, the whole idea of objectivity really grew, I believe, from an economic imperative. As more, as fewer and fewer newspapers existed within cities, uh, as you know, as, as the trend of capitalism is always to stamp out the competition and establish monopoly. So at a certain point in the 50s and 60s, there were monopolies pretty much in all cities uh, in the United States. There was one major newspaper or two. In order to keep readers, and by keeping readers, they kept the advertisers, they had to establish what they believed to be a public commons. Where all uh, and so that people could see the newspaper or the news organization as above the fray, uh, and therefore they could attract more and more readers, and therefore the readers would bring more advertisers. So it was an economic imperative, not just simply an ethical or political imperative. Uh, and I think that um, uh, because that's not what existed previously, the press in America was always partisan. Uh, you know, the the New York Post was founded by uh, Alexander Hamilton as a Federalist. Uh, paper and Thomas Jefferson had his paper, the Aurora in Philadelphia, and they battled, and there were constant battles between uh, the newspapers and uh, and later on radio and television stations on, on their perspectives and their views. It's only in the mid 20th to late 20th century that the idea, this concept of objective journalism, came into being, and I believe it was had an economic underpinning. The, an economic imperative, not simply an ethical imperative. Uh, and uh, because you had to attract everybody to the same publication uh, to keep it, you know, making money. Uh, Wouldn't you say that it was also, <clears throat> you know, who defined objective? I mean, wasn't it people up top who defined what was objective? I mean, seeing you and two black reporters going to cover a story was like, that's not objective. And it wasn't, it was, those folks up there deciding, who probably were white men. Yeah, you know, you know, what are they conspiring about? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and the yeah. whiteness is sort of uh, centered in the objectivity, you know, and deciding that other opinions are are subjective. Yeah. Dave, you, uh, Dave's just back from <laughs> Somos in Puerto Rico. <laughs> I was doing other things at Somos, but <laughs> I'll talk about that later. I uh, followed loosely in Juan's path, uh, not, not as, uh, uh, not to the extent that he has, obviously, but uh, you know, he's been a great inspiration to me. I remember when he first walked into uh, uh, Olivia Delgado de Torres' uh, class in, in LIU, where I went in Brooklyn, and started talking about the Young Lords. I was a business major. I radically changed it to a journalism major <laughs> and, uh, and continued to get involved more in Puerto Rican organizations back then. Uh, as, as, as I am now, and that's kind of like the basis of my question, Juan. Uh, back then, we had so many institutions and so many organizations, from the National Congress to Puerto Rican Rights to the Puerto Rican Legal Defense and Education Fund to you name the gamut. Um, they were there, and they were presente, and they did a lot of work um, for the Puerto, Puerto Rican community uh, back then, and up until now, but we're losing a lot of that. We've lost a lot of those organizations. We lost a lot of those great leaders you mentioned. Um, Luis Galdin, but you know, Angelo Falcón was one of those muckrakers here locally that really stuck it to the establishment many a time, and 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 we don't have that dearth of you know talent anymore, in my opinion. Um, that's really lifting up those voices of the voiceless, especially, and um, and holding these account of, you know these elected officials and others in power accountable. So in your your you know 40, 50 plus years of doing this kind of work in the Puerto Rican community, not just in New York but in Philadelphia. And in other places, you know, like I mentioned, I spent some time in Philadelphia as well. And, um, you know, there's still so much poverty and so much need in the, in the, in the Boricua community in all of these places. And um, our numbers are dwindling here in New York City, as is our political power 
and also uh, the power that we have in terms of institutions. So I, I'm not sure why you're going up north when you should be going to Puerto Rico uh, <laughs> to, to soak up some of that sun, but that's, that's all fine and good. But where do you see, and, and Chicago also has some great institutions still and a great Puerto Rican community, but where, where, where do you see our community now and, and, uh, and how do you see it getting out of some of the problems that continue to exist? Well, that's a big question, and uh, I don't, I'm not sure I have the answer. I, I just would say this. Um, um, the waning of political power in, uh, by Puerto Ricans in New York is just a fun function, I believe, of the demographics. You know, that the, the composition of the Latino community in the United States is continually being transformed. The center of Puerto Rican uh, e existence right now is no longer New York, I don't think, it's Central Florida. That's where, that's where the real migrations are occurring, both of the Puerto Ricans who were retired from Chicago and New York and moved to a warmer climate, but they didn't go to Puerto Rico because they were worried about the crime, they went to Central Florida. Uh, and the young professionals who couldn't deal with the, uh, with the climate catastrophe that was, have been occurring in Puerto Rico have moved to Florida. Uh, so now the, the, the largest concentration of Puerto Ricans is in Florida, and those Puerto Ricans who used to live in New York, you go to go upstate, go upstate, go to uh, go to uh, Easton, Pennsylvania, go to uh, Long Island. They've they've been forced out of the major cities as a result of gentrification, but they're now in the suburbs, <laughs> and people wonder why have the suburbs turned increasingly democratic when they used to be Republican. Well, because so many African Americans and Latinos were forced out of the cities. <laughs> they went up to Yonkers, they went up to, you know, uh, up to uh, uh, upstate, they went down south, they went to other places. Same thing in Chicago, they're being forced out. So the cities are being reclaimed uh, uh, under capitalism now as fortresses of, of wealth, whereas, and the poor are being shunted as they were, as they were in Europe after World War II, into the far out suburbs, because yeah, that's the way it is in Europe. And Europe got a chance to rebuild all of its cities after World War II, and they put the poor all the way out in the, distance, in the far outs. Uh, and that's what America has been doing in its cities, pushing the poor out. And so now the the political power is dispersed, but it's not like it's not as if it's disappeared. It's just you have to have new forms of organization. Uh, and uh, and uh, and you have to work more in these suburban areas and the small towns than you do in the big central cities as we did in the past. Yeah. Hello, great great lecture, Juan. Uh, gracias. I, I want to ask, what are independent news doing to denounce the ch concerning increase? of Latin American periodists have been killed while denouncing corruption in Colombia, Mexico, Peru, and all those Latin American countries. Well, in democracy now, we've been covering quite a few, you know, and obviously Mexico is the worst place in the world right now That's where there's not a shooting war that is uh, uh, for journalists, and, and it has been in the past in, in Colombia as well. Uh, yeah, I mean, Latin American journalists uh, tend to be pretty outspoken and they tend to be feared <laughs> by those in power and there are ways that uh, attempts to shut them shut them down uh, and uh, but we've certainly covered it and uh, uh, at democracy now and uh, we hope to continue to do so in the future because it is important to 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 uh, shine a light uh, on these things to, uh, as much as possible to let those in power know that there's someone watching what happens uh, in these countries uh, and um, uh, but uh, but we have we have covered it extensively on democracy now. Thank you for your speech. It was very inspiring. I really needed it because sometimes I feel like like the world won't get better. I feel like the establishment and the bureaucracy has already won. And I feel this way when I walk through like East Harlem and I see brownstones going for a million dollars, or when I walk uptown and I see Columbia's campus expanding. And um, as a as a member of the, as a former member of the young, uh, the young lords, you have a lot of uh, insight into like social movement and social or like organizing. And my question is, is like, what led to the decline of the young lords, and was it like internal pressure or external pressure? Yeah. Well, it was a combination of things. Um, first of all, we were very young. 
we were all 18, 19, 20, 21 years old, and so we got a little, uh, f our, our heads filled with thinking we were all powerful, you know, and, and, uh, and, uh, uh, and so there was some arrogance in some of the stuff that we did that began to create divisions in the organization. There was a systematic effort by the government to d divide the organizations, the co and so pro program. We, had, we were very bad at figuring out who the agents were. We expelled a few people that we thought were agents who weren't, and we missed the agents that stayed who created all the divisions, <laughs> right? Uh, and uh, so uh, we knew there were agents, we just couldn't figure out the best way to find them. <laughs> and, uh, and so that created a lot of divisions within the organization. We made some political mistakes. Uh, we expanded to Puerto Rico thinking that, well, the Puerto Rican people are one people, all the leadership of the, the left in Puerto Rico is basically upper class and, and, uh, and uh, divorced from the people. We came from the ghettos, we could show them how to do things better, but we couldn't, most of us couldn't even speak Spanish fluently. And, uh, and so <laughs> we, were, we found ourselves, we found ourselves in deep doo-doo in Puerto Rico. But we spent so much money and effort that it demoralized a lot of people and created splits in the organization. So immaturity, uh, overt government efforts, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and arrogance, you know, all those things combined to split the organization uh, up. Uh, and, um, uh, but one thing that I learned from that, as I, as I said before, learn from your mistakes and always, un always accept as a principle that you could be wrong. Stand up for your principles, but always be open to the possibility that you're wrong <laughs> and that the other person is right. Because if not, then you really clamp down and you create more uh, trouble for yourself. Uh, and uh, so ever, ever since those experiences, which really damaged people, there was a lot of, a lot of stuff that damaged uh, folks in the 70s and a lot of the left organizations in the country. Uh, is you have to sort of like be willing to be more open when you have disagreements with folks uh, and try to figure out a way to stay together. Don't split, stay together as much as possible and resolve your differences. Yeah. Hi Juan, hi Ed, I'm very proud of you both um, as Puerto Ricans. Um, just two quick questions. Um, my name is Erica, I'm an alum of the Columbia J School and I hope a lot of things have changed here. Um, so two quick questions. Um, how, in the last few years, we've had these racial uh, reckonings and a lot of naming in the way that we haven't seen in uh, the way that we talk about as progressives, but not in the quote unquote mainstream news media where we've had naming of misogyny and patriarchy and, and white supremacy, et cetera, et cetera. But there's this refusal, so it seems, to, to name colonialism when the US has five colonies. So, would love to hear your thoughts about, um, even though Puerto Rico's been in the spotlight even more so over the last five, five years, why that seems to be, there seems to be this inability of the news media to name that particular system. And then the other, two, the other thing I'd like you to talk about is, um, I mean, you took, you took on the Bloomberg administration quite a bit and would love, to talk, would love to hear about how New York City news media to some degree colluded with Bloomberg's um, um, knockdown of term limits, you know, or ra rather extending term limits so that he could land himself a third term. You know, on, on colonialism, you know, uh, there's not, there's not a whole lot that, there's a lot to say, but we don't have time to get into it here, but in a very short, short, uh, Synopsis. I think the main un thing to understand is that most Americans are not comfortable thinking that we're an imperial country, <laughs> that we are the dominant uh, country in the world, and that we believe that that's the natural order of things. <laughs> uh, and of course, we're the we're the number one USA. You know, uh, and the 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 idea that we still have captive peoples. Uh, uh, in in, a, in an age when colonies are supposed to have disappeared, uh, is uh, it's hard for people to fathom. So it is important to constantly explain the United States say, still has a small colonial empire. It's not as big as it used to be when it had the Philippines and and when it still controlled Cuba and uh, and uh, uh, and uh, but 
and Puerto Rico is by far the biggest of the colonies. Uh, and uh, you know, it's it's ironic that all the all the power, the, the political power of the Puerto Rican community is in the U.S. Right? There are four Puerto Rican congressmen. Right. Uh, Darren Soto in uh, in Florida, uh, uh, Alexandra Casio Cortez, uh, Nidia Velasquez, and what's it? Richie and Richie Torres, uh, who, what? who took over for Jose Serrano. So there are four voting members of the Puerto Rican members in the U.S. Congress. There are none in Puerto Rico. <laughs> right? There's one who has a voice but no vote, a resident commissioner. So how is it possible? that all the political power of the Puerto Rican people is in the US, <laughs> not in Puerto Rico, in the homeland. Uh, and, and why is that tolerated? Uh, and uh, so I think that, um, that uh, we got constantly hit on the colonial situation. Now the other problem is that the Puerto Rican people uh, have had 120 something years to try to come up with fashion a solution that, that they can come as a group to Washington and say, this is what we want. Uh, and they we're getting closer, we're getting closer, the last, last series of bills are getting closer. Uh, and, uh, but uh, the United States has to accept the sovereignty of Puerto Rico. And the analogy that I always make is, because the United States doesn't need Puerto Rico anymore as, as a colony, it really doesn't. Uh, all the things that it had it as a colony for, it no longer needs it for. But it's easier to get married than it is to get divorced, right? Divorce, <laughs> divorce has all kinds of problems that you gotta settle stuff. Who's gonna get what and how are we gonna do this and what's gonna happen? And, uh, and uh, so that's the problem. The United States doesn't want Puerto Rico anymore but they don't know how to, how to get rid of it. Uh, Puerto Ricans don't uh, feel that they're oppressed as a people by the United States but they can't figure out what the solution can be that is amenable to both sides. Uh, and so that's the issue, that, that there's a colonial situation, everyone has to understand it, but then what's the solution? Uh, and, uh, uh, and I, you know, it's, I read my Harvest of Empire, you'll see the solution that I, I support. Uh, but, uh, but I think that uh, th that's the, f the fundamental question. We haven't, one, got it to the American people, and then two, figured out among Puerto Ricans what's the, the ultimate solution uh, to the fact that uh, we are a separate nation. We have a separate language. We have, a, unlike all the other territories that became states, every territory of this country that became a state, by the time it became a state, a majority or plurality of the people in the territory were Anglo American, including Hawaii. Uh, New Mexico waited until 1912 because there were too many Mexicans in New Mexico. Uh, and uh, there was a plurality of, of whites in Hawaii by the time it became a state. Puerto Rico, after 120 years, was never settled by Anglos. To this day, 90% of the people in Puerto Rico are Puerto Rican, 90, 95%. They speak a different language, they have a different culture. Uh, it's a separate nation, <laughs> simple as that, <laughs> but legally, it's still part of the United States, and we've got to solve that. We've got to solve that problem, uh, and um, it will be solved. <laughs> I have, I have hope it will be solved because sooner or later it's going to get too costly for the empire. Uh, but we'll see. The Bloomberg. Uh, oh, Bloomberg. Bloomberg's. Yeah. What can I say about Michael Bloomberg? Uh, 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 same thing happened with the media and Giuliani. I remember uh, at, uh, after uh, after nine uh, after the nine eleven attacks, uh, the Daily News wanted to print an editorial uh, allowing Giuliani to stay as mayor, even though his two terms were up, because he had done such a great job as America's mayor in c getting us through the crisis of the terrorist attacks. And I remember talking to the editorial, but are you crazy? You know, in the midst of World War II. You know, uh, that w we didn't decide, oh, we're going to cancel an election, you know, an election result, you know, because uh, uh, in the midst of the Civil War and all these other wars that we've had in the United States, uh, you know, the, the normal transfer of powers have occurred. So why do you now in New York City, because of one attack, want to keep Giuliani, you know, in office, even after he's supposed to be going out of office? And 
Giuliani tried it, he didn't succeed. And then Bloomberg did the same thing, but he did succeed because he had more money. Uh, and he just bought everybody out. Uh, he just, uh, he, he paid enormous sums of money uh, to all kinds of community organizations to pressure the council to let him eliminate term limits. And uh, uh, Calvin Butts, uh, rest, rest, may you rest in peace, uh, got about a million dollars from uh, Rudy Giuliani the year that uh, he helped mobilize the city count, you know, in city council to overturn term limits. And, uh, and uh, so a lot of these people were bought out, uh, bought out by Giuliani because he had, he had the money. I mean, by Bloomberg because uh, he had the money, because he had the money. So one more, uh, yeah, one more. The, yeah, the last one because it's going to yes. late, right? Yeah. yeah, we're over time, but yeah. we're workers. Just one, you should take some credit for Giuliani. I think Juan, you should give yourself some credit for showing that Giuliani wasn't the great mayor. Um, you know, a lot of people claim to that he was, and he did, but I think it was your reporting that really showed that he wasn't, and in some ways he was part of the problem of 9/11, not the savior. Oh, uh, absolutely. I mean, you know, there were so many. Uh, and, uh, all you have to do is ask policemen and firemen, <laughs> and they'll tell you what they think of Giuliani because uh, uh, he he had the uh, he uh, the radios that the firemen uh, that the firemen could not hear the call to evacuate the buildings once they were about to come down. The, all the radios failed. There were radios that they had been complaining about to the Giuliani administration, and they did nothing about. Uh, and uh, we ended up over 300 firemen killed uh, as a result of the fact they didn't hear the orders to get out of the buildings uh, on their bad radios. Uh, uh, he, he, he built the city's emergency command center on, this, on, uh, on a high b uh, floor in Seven World Trade Center. So when Seven World Trade collapsed, the city lost all communication capacity for its emergency services. There were a whole bunch of dumb decisions and now of course and then he refused to acknowledge that people were getting sick as a result of all the exposures uh, from the chemicals that were released uh, for year uh, for months after the the fires uh, uh, after the attack and uh, he just completely botched the recovery effort and uh, uh, at, uh, at ground zero uh, so but then you know all things come out in the wash America found out eventually. <laughs> what he was really like <laughs> those of us who knew him more closely uh, more closely were saying you'll see you'll see eventually <laughs> you'll see what this guy is about yeah. okay i think i speak for the rest of the panel uh, in saying that we're very honored that you asked us to be part of this and uh, we wish you well, it's my honor my privilege to be with you it's a great group of people here yeah. and i think everyone uh, wants to wish you a uh, uh, safe and uh, successful move to Chicago and hope that we all stay in touch. Thanks everyone for coming. Thank you.